Over the years, we've tried to bring in every variety of persimmon we can get our hands on because that's what the land is telling us we should be growing on this spot. Oops, puppy. Hey, puppy. <laughs> All right, so this is a young forest. Uh, this piece of ground was a cornfield before we started the project in 2012, and now it's starting the transition into a forest. And we're trying to work with the succession process that the ecosystem is producing here. That means a lot of very thick growth. This soil having been tilled for hundreds of years, it was very beat up when we came into the property, very low organic matter. So all of this thick, crazy vegetation that you see everywhere, um, this is doing a great job of, of building up biomass, providing habitat for, for insects and other wildlife, and starting to get the, the place uh, more and more habitable for the fruit crops that we want to grow here. When you're working in a site that has degraded soil, building up nitrogen and other fertility in the soil is super important. So one thing, when beginning the project, we seeded in a lot of nitrogen fixing species. This is one, this is red clover, um, nice broadly available seed that fixes atmospheric nitrogen and makes it into nitrate, which is huge, uh, hugely important for the growing of of all kinds of trees. So you have this red clover, and then as a contrast, you, here's another type of clover here. Uh, this is the white clover, and they each occupy a slightly different niche, both really useful in the garden. So the red clover can hang out in this tall uh, meadow type vegetation and hold its own and, and grow in that type of location. If we mowed the red clover, it would die. It can't take that kind of condition. The white clover, on the other hand, uh, this uh, can take mowing. Uh, that this, this grows in our lawn pads and is adding nitrogen there, but it can't survive in the shade of this tall uh, meadow as, as a competition. So each one occupies a different niche and they're both here fixing nitrogen and building up the soil. So everything we do in a forest garden, we're trying to learn from the forest itself. When that was young, that forest was all full of black locust trees. And so with that in mind, one of the first things that I planted out here when we started toward a forest was also black locust trees. You can see one behind me here. Black locust is with the feathery foliage on it, the sort of larger tree in the middle distance. That is a pioneer species of tree. So it is a nitrogen fixing plant it doesn't mind bad soil. It gets in there and it starts to build the soil and it's the fastest growing thing in the garden. So it gives a huge boost to getting this place started toward, uh, toward becoming a forest from a, from a beat up old farm field. So we planted those and at the same time, the, those pioneer black locusts that were growing back in the woods They've done their job and died, but they produce a highly rot resistant wood, which we were able to pick up in the existing forest, dead black locust posts, and, and that's how we built our deer fence here. This is the most rot resistant wood species that grows around here, and so we've been able to use it for a variety of things around the garden. It's a neat local resource uh, here in the eastern United States. So one thing about a forest garden is there's a lot going on at any given time. The mission is to reintegrate people and our lives and everything that we use with the forest ecosystem, and that's a tall order. What we found here is it's been a really great pleasure to involve other people with other skills in the garden, including the beekeepers. We have these really cool beekeepers that have something like 
nine or ten hives in the garden at this point. They're producing a lot of honey, overwintering well, and providing their pollination services, and I never touch them. So throughout the project, we've been looking for opportunities to bring in people with other skills, like maybe an herbal medicine person, or we have this one lady who weaves baskets out of some of the stuff that we uh, harvest here. A forest garden is, is a big project and there are many skills involved. And we find like every time we can involve another person with another skill set, the whole uh, system grows stronger. So I didn't get into forest gardening to do a lot of mowing, but I do have some opinions regarding trails. I've visited plenty of forest gardens where the feeling of the place is on the claustrophobic side and where the trails may not be very well defined or very comfortable. Especially if you've had, say, a rainy or dewy situation and you have a lot of vegetation encroaching on the pathways, it just makes for a place that's not that comfortable for people to be. And to me, it is very important to make a forest garden a comfortable place for people. It is a, it is a people habitat. So I do end up doing a fair amount of mowing to maintain broad, comfortable trails around the forest garden. We still have, of course, uh, tons of lushness and vegetation going on, but in order to make sure that people are comfortable here, I like them to be able to walk in the trails, know where they're going, not encounter too many spiders and briars if they do not want to do that. Um, so for me, the trails and the maintenance of them is important in a forest garden. This site has a lot of wild blackberries grown, growing here. Uh, they're thorny and somewhat productive of blackberries. Taking a cue from that, we grow these thornless varieties of blackberry where the fruit quality is a little bit better and the plant is a little bit less aggressive and, and easier to deal with. And uh, this is a major principle for us. If we find a native plant growing around here, we want to either learn how to use that plant or grow with something that's closely related and, and feature that in the forest garden. Mm. Yummy. Want some? <laughs> mm. Yalpan holly is the only native plant that has caffeine in it. And as such, it was super important to the Native Americans. Um, so what you do is you harvest the young growing tips, you dry it, and, uh, and then depending on what flavor you're going for, you can roast it for a little while, pound it with a mortar and pestle, and then make this lovely caffeinated tea. Tastes uh, kind of like yerba mate, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it's a lovely caffeinated drink and the plant itself as an evergreen uh, looks beautiful in the landscape. You can prune it into a hedge or, or whatever you need. Works well in the front yard if you need a dressy kind of a look. And it also produces berries that are not edible to people, but are important uh, food for, for birds and other wildlife. Growing right here behind the Yalpon holly is one of my favorite plants in the garden. Passion fruit. This is our native passion fruit. It's called Maypops. And uh, many parts of this plant are edible, including the flowers, which are like, in terms of edible flowers, this is a very nice one. It's, it's crispy and sweet. Uh, the, the young tips of this plant are also edible. That is a very nice uh, salad ingredient. Uh, it's a, I would describe it as, as sort of nutty and, and, and hearty sort of a green, very nice sauteed or in salad. And then later, like in, in the season, it makes, it makes passion fruit. Like uh, it's a sort of a green egg shaped fruit uh, full of absolutely wonderful sweet tart um, cells in there that you eat. Uh, this is a vine, so it tends to scramble and, and run all over the place. We're growing it here on this fence. By the end of the season, it'll cover this fence and the trellis uh, structure outside. Every year, it'll grow up the fence and then die back down to the ground. So 
if you have a chain link fence or something like that, it's a very good plant for, for covering up something like that. You wouldn't really grow a grape on a chain link fence because it's going to make a trunk that will get tangled up in the fence over time. But this, because it's uh, an annual grow and then start over again, it's perfect uh, for those type of situations. Mm. One of my favorite edible flowers. Such a nice plant. It's supposed to be uh, an anti-anxiety as, as an herbal medicine too. So here's a spot where you have an interesting contrast going on. You have a plant that we brought in and then a native plant right beside, which provides some interesting contrasts. Here's an apple tree. Um, this is probably William's Pride, one of the disease resistant apples. It grows okay around here. We get, um, you know, decent quantity of cider quality apples off of these trees most years. We don't spray any insecticides or herbicides anywhere in the garden. So um, without the, that kind of help, your apples are going to be somewhat limited, but, but still usable. Now, in contrast, right next to the apple tree, you have a persimmon tree, a couple of them actually. Persimmon, American persimmon, is something that occurs wild here on this site. It took us a couple of years into the project before we realized the whole place was growing up with persimmons that we did not plant. Um, when the persimmons in the wild woods are ripe, you find fox poops all over the place here that are full of persimmon seeds. So these foxes have been out here planting the persimmons for who knows uh, how long before we even got to the property. And what we do with these persimmons is we let some of them just grow as is and then some of them we graft. So we will, we will cut that tree and then graft it with an improved variety of persimmon. And compared to the apples, these things are incredibly productive and just trouble free. They're always happy. They are native to here. They're completely happy with this soil and climate. They occurred here without, uh, you know, on their own. In fact, they even occur in the, in the hay field next to this property where they mow that field and they mow down the persimmon trees and they persist through being mowed and they just grow back. So it's an incredibly tough and well adapted plant for this particular place. And so while I wasn't all that familiar with persimmons going into the project. The land is saying loud and clear, this should be a persimmon farm. So over the years, we've tried to pay as much attention and respect to that as possible, bring in every variety of persimmon we can get our hands on and really emphasize that because that's what the land is telling us we should be growing on this spot. You want an apple? So we grow vegetables in the forest garden. And one thing we're very interested in is the lowest possible maintenance vegetables. So we grow tomatoes and peppers and kale, those kind of things. But we also grow things like this Jerusalem artichoke, or also known as sunchoke, which this is in the sunflower family and it produces a root crop in great abundance and needs absolutely no care from us whatsoever. We got this patch started a few years ago, and now this plant just fends for itself. It lives out here in the meadow and produces food without any care from people whatsoever. Also has a nice uh, flower on it later in the season. Potatoes, these white potatoes here, they need a little bit more care, but we're always interested in like, what's the minimum amount of care that we need for these different plants. Squash, we've found, uh, has been one of the best where we can start it in a little pile of compost in the meadow and just leave it alone for the rest of the season. It goes crazy, wanders off into the meadow. All we have to do is come in there at the end of the season and you find all these huge squashes in there. It's fantastic. Uh, so we're doing this type of an experiment with the potatoes this year. We are hilling them from time to time as you do but we're, we're not giving them like a premium, uh, very well cared for vegetable site. We're giving them more of a 
more of a, more of a marginal is like a pile of compost uh, with a meadow all around and we want to see can we produce potatoes under these conditions how are our yields in forest gardening it's very much about how can we sort of work with and massage the local ecosystem to produce food for us but without having to do a huge amount of disturbance a huge amount of labor So one thing we deal with here, as with many landscapes, is invasive plants. We have, you name it, they're, they're, many of them are here. Uh, this is Japanese stilt grass. We, we have Japanese honeysuckle, uh, many other things. Once in a while, we find a native plant that can hold its own or even take over a niche from one of these invasives. And this is one of those discoveries. Much of what you're seeing, and I, I understand, like this location, it is a little hard to see what's going on. This is a plant called American groundnut, Apios americana. It's actually a domesticated crop that the Indians developed as a high protein tuber. Um, so it's a legume, uh, it's making that nitrogen, making that protein, and it's a vine. And what we found is on this fence situation and in this meadow situation, even though we have the presence of Japanese honeysuckle, throughout the growing season, this will grow over top of the Japanese honeysuckle that also grows on this fence. So it's a kind of a, a somewhat rare example where we can introduce a native plant that wasn't here previously, and it can take back over from, this, uh, from the invasive plants that were here. Uh, so that's been exciting to see. We also do come through here in the wintertime and cut the Japanese honeysuckle because while the groundnut is dormant underground, the Japanese honeysuckle is evergreen. So that gives us a chance to set back the invasive plant uh, a little bit further. So down here in this patch, um, a little bit wetter than some other areas in the field so we're trying out some things that like that type of wet condition uh, this is high bush cranberry um, it's a very happy native plant plenty of wildlife benefit the the berries are pretty nasty unless you like process them with a whole lot of sugar uh, at which time you know they make a decent cranberry sauce um, whoever the salesman is for cranberries does a great job but you know nice native plant uh, for what it is you got your nitrogen fixation happening in this patch from the black locust trees. Uh, this is our future canopy tree. This is an oak. I believe this is a swamp white burr oak cross, which is one of the most productive of acorns. Uh, we grow a lot of different species of oak here because of their potential for human food. It's actually one of the most forgotten and overlooked foods in America right now. Um, but it was tremendously important to the Native Americans. The quantity of food produced per acre is comparable to wheat, and it has the potential to play a major role in our diet. We that live in the, the forested ecosystem of the eastern United States need to stop ignoring acorns and, uh, and make use of the amazing food that you can make out of it. We've made many um, cool different acorn foods. The chef that does the forest to table dinners here has made acorn falafel, acorn granola, acorn noodles, um, different acorn breads, uh, acorn jelly, like the way the Koreans do it. So many different cool dishes. So we're really excited to be able to share these things with people and to grow the dozen or so different species of oak that show the most potential to contribute to uh, the human food supply. So there are a bunch of plants that um, can grow in the shade for quite a period of time waiting for their opportunity to emerge into the sun as they get older. Uh, hickory is one example of this. This is shellbark hickory, which is one of the nicer tasting hickory nuts. They do take a very long time to begin producing, but 
as a way of transitioning a forested area towards something that is more productive of nuts that are useful to people. Uh, hickories are a nice example of that. And this one's well underway. Over on the other side here, this is a smooth alder plant, which is just a nice native nitrogen fixer, building up the soil. Uh, a little bit smaller than your black locust and, and things like that. Produces many stems, um, but can be cut back to the ground uh, whenever necessary, and it will re-sprout. So as a chop and drop source of nitrogen-rich foliage, alder is a, it's a great native plant. Over here, you have another plant that I, I'm excited about. Uh, that is butternut, which is or also known as white walnut. This is uh, native to this region, and the, the quality of the fruit is quite pleasant. A little bit um, more mild and, and easier to shell than the black walnut. Uh, we have not uh, had nuts on here yet, but the plants seem to be growing well, and, and I'm excited to see whether we start to get some, some butternuts off of this. With a name like that, it's got to be good, right? This plant back here is uh, American elderberry. Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelt of elderberries. Um, with the big white flowers on it. It's got a couple of cool uses. Uh, this time of year, we are harvesting flowers, which are edible and just nice as a decoration on top of, of any kind of a salad. Uh, people make them into fritters uh, or cordial. And then once the berries ripen, you can see the berries starting to come along here. Uh, they'll, they'll ripen up into a deep purple colored berry that is actually used medicinally as an, an immune support. And this plant is, again, very well adapted to this environment. We found wild elderberry growing in this woods edge um, with us not having planted it. So taking a cue from that, we got a few selections of, of elderberry where they have uh, their extra productive of the berries and we planted them into adjacent locations um, figuring that the wild one there is indicating this would be a good spot to grow that plant. So that's American elder. So a lot of the maintenance we do this time of year is uh, in the summertime is uh, scything. When we have a small plant, especially like uh, this little pomegranate here, uh, we we need to go around and remove the, the tall vegetation before it completely swamps it. And uh, this has been a really good tool for this. Um, this is a European scythe with a, with a ditch blade on it. And it allows you to get right up close to the trunk of your plant and cut away the vegetation that's starting to encroach. And then once we're done moving the vegetation back away from the perimeter, all that remains is um, a little bit of hand weeding right in the center of that plant. This pomegranate is looking a little sad because of the cicadas right now, but it does have plenty of life in it. And I'm just gonna come in here where these uh, grasses are growing too close to the plant for me to reach with a scythe. And uh, like here is a trumpet creeper vine, for example, which will cover this if I let it, if I leave it. Um, so, so that's pretty much the summer maintenance regime. We also come through and add mulch from time to time, sometimes cardboard and mulch, which also helps reduce the weeds. So this is mimosa or albizia, which is a, an invasive plant. Uh, it's all over this area. So we didn't plant it here, but it just occurs. It is, however, a potent nitrogen fixer. It's one of the, the most productive 
adders of fertility to the soil. So what we do with these is, you know, it wants to become a full-size tree. We let it grow up a little bit and then knock it down. Uh, permaculture technique called chop and drop where um, we'll come through here and just like break all of these things off. Each of those is full of fertility to add to the soil and the plant will, will grow will grow right back the way it was after it's been um, after it's been cut. So here in the eastern United States in the mid-Atlantic near DC, um, as any of you from this area already know, we have this plant called the Bradford pear, which is a crazy invasive. The Bradford pear was brought over here from China in about the 1950s and planted aggressively for many years and then it went feral and it pops up and grows like crazy in any empty field that is let go, including this one. So they pop up by the thousands in this location. A Bradford pear produces a small, bitter, inedible fruit. But what we found is that we can cut the Bradford pear and graft onto it with a selected and very good variety of fruiting pear. So we have all these wild invasive rootstocks already in place and we can top work them and produce a good crop of pears. This has been one of the most easy and trouble-free fruits for us to grow here working with this invasive that we have found here on site. The, uh, the, this is a European pear variety. You can also grow the Asian pear which is a, a round and crunchy juicy type of pear um, and they, they've, they've just been a great uh, crop for us. And it's no longer invasive once it's been top worked to, uh, to produce this kind of good fruit. Also in this patch you have um, jujube or Chinese date. Uh, this has been a very very neat crop for us. I'm pretty excited about this. It's a fruit kind of midway between a date and an apple. So this is where we grow our delicious uh, shiitake mushrooms. Uh, there's the piles of logs with the shiitakes growing in them. When they're ready, when we're ready to have them fruit, we soak them in a tank for a day and then pull them out. These logs over here have just been soaked and they are just starting to fruit. They're pinning, which means just emerging. And uh, by the time they start to grow, they, they ripen pretty quickly. So these tiny little, little mushrooms that are just emerging here, they will be ready to harvest uh, within uh, about a week uh, or less. Spice bush is a really nice uh, shade crop. It grows wild in the forests around here quite a lot. And you can see the, the young berries developing here. They'll ripen up and turn red in the fall. And at that point, you harvest the berry, dry it, and grind it into a powder, which people use the way you would use allspice. And to me, it has notes of cinnamon in it. And it's a very cool thing to add either in baking or, or to a drink or something. And it's just, it's a native plant that uh, produces in great quantity. So pomegranate is a relatively new plant to us. We've been growing it for a bunch of years, but this is the first time we've seen any flowers on it. I have friends in, in DC that produce pomegranates like crazy. So I'm pretty excited about potentially getting our first little crop of pomegranates off of this. So if you think you don't like mulberries or you find them boring, I would definitely recommend that you try out some of the selected varieties. This one is called Illinois Everbearing Mulberry, and in my opinion, the fruit, the taste, and the texture is way better than your average wild mulberry. It's extremely productive, extremely easy to grow. Um, we've already been in here, probably harvested uh, maybe 20 or 30 pounds of mulberries off of a few shakings. We just lay a uh, berry harvest net on the ground here and shake the tree and you get all these amazing fruit. Um, one of the easiest things to grow in the garden. Definitely a favorite among kids and, and other visitors.
So in year 10 uh, on this site, we've pretty well finished planting the tree canopy layer of the garden and just letting those trees grow out. But we still are actively planting into the shrub layers and the, the smaller plants in the garden. Uh, here's an example, a row of blueberry bushes that we just put in this spring. And it shows a technique that works pretty well for us. Uh, we'll put down a thick layer of cardboard on the ground. Uh, you can see it putting, sticking out a little bit there. And then we'll cover that with uh, a lot of wood chips. And you can see some weeds coming through, but it really does slow down the weeds. You see compared to the background rate of weeds growing back here, it just slows everything down enough that makes it a lot more uh, easy to maintain using um, this uh, cardboard plus mulch combination. Uh, coming back in the fall, I'll be picking up bags of leaves from my neighbors when everybody collects their yard waste into those big paper bags. And I'll be bringing those out here. And whenever I find a bag like that that's full of pine needles, those are designated for the blueberries because blueberries like that acidity that's provided by pine needles. So that'll be the next layer of mulch that will be going on to this planting uh, to try to give them the conditions that they like. So one thing we try to promote in the forest garden is as high a diversity of plant life and the associated insect and animal life that goes with the plants. There's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, some of the plants are beautiful, of course, uh, which is nice. But it's also the fact that Many insects specialize and they need a particular type of flower for their nectar source. Their caterpillars need a particular type of leaf to eat. So the greater the diversity of plants in this landscape, the greater the diversity of insects. And that in turn leads to a reduction in pest issues on the property. Right now we're looking at cone flower, which is a nice source of nectar. You can see these butterflies using it right now. Uh, by the time they go to seed, that then becomes a source of food for finches and other birds that eat the seeds. But these nectar sources, they are also a, an important part of the diet of predatory wasps. So predatory wasps, very often they'll need nectar from their particular favorite flower as an adult. And then having gotten as much nectar as they need, they'll go find a pest insect and prey on that pest insect. So you need a good supply of nectar in the landscape to have that population of wasps that are very beneficial in helping control the pests. So these are Japanese beetles. And in the first year or two of the garden, they were a major problem for us. It was a big empty field and we had just planted tiny fruit trees into the field. Few, you know, tiny little saplings with a few dozen leaves each. The Japanese beetles descended. You'd have hundreds of them on every single little seedling and they would eat every leaf. And then the tree would struggle and push out a new set of leaves and they would eat every leaf all over again. I lost some trees this way, despite the fact that I was out here shaking the beetles off into a bucket of water, removing them as fast as I could. So that was an issue. As time went on though, the diversity of the garden began to increase, including a bunch of predators that eat some of these Japanese beetles. When you're managing pests this way, you're never going to eliminate every last beetle. Like that's not how nature tends to work, but you definitely can blunt the population spikes in, in insects like this. And the net result is you just don't have the terrible pressure put onto your little plants. So part of how this works is specific habitat for the predators that consume these beetles. That includes, importantly, the blue wing wasp. And this insect needs nectar from particular plants, uh, including goldenrod and things in the mint family. That's what it needs when it's an adult. But then when it's done being an adult, it goes in the soil, it finds a Japanese beetle larva, and it lays its egg into the Japanese beetle larva. The wasp larva consumes the Japanese beetle. We didn't have these wasps in the landscape for the first couple of years because there was no goldenrod, which is a necessary part of their habitat. But as the goldenrod started to grow, 
Every time it blooms, you see it covered with these wasps and the number of Japanese beetles on our, our young fruit trees has declined significantly. We have never had another set of young plantings knocked out by Japanese beetles the way we did in 2012-13 in the subsequent uh, however many, seven or eight years. Uh, we have never had an issue with Japanese beetles. And I think that's partly due to the increase in diversity and the helpful predators that now have a habitat suitable for them out in the forest garden. Here we have um, coneflower and wild bergamot having germinated from seed, providing important uh, bee and other insect pollinator habitat. The bergamot, the one with the with the lighter pink flowers is also a very lovely tea. It's a, it makes a slightly peppery tasting tea. So a lot of the diversity uh, native perennials that are out here were grown from seed, like this uh, black-eyed Susan here. Uh, and then additionally, we do also plant some plants with it from division. This is Maryland Senna, which is a nice uh, native nitrogen fixer. With this, you can dig that plant up, cut the roots into like 20 different pieces and plant each one and the root will grow and it competes well in the, in the meadow matrix. So uh, we planted things like this, different asters, comfrey, uh, just generally beneficial plants all over the property, uh, whether by, from divisions or uh, from seed. So for the life of the project so far, we've been in this location, which is sort of a high end dry top of hill type of location, good for growing various fruits. But more recently, we've added a wetland location down in the woods, which allows us to grow a whole set of other cool plants that prefer that wet soil and even growing in the water itself. So this is the new wetland portion of the forest garden. We just last summer dug this small pond that allows us to grow plants that like to grow in the water. And in addition to that, the, the whole valley has a variety of different swampy soils that will be suitable for growing a range of plants that are adapted to that type of environment. So we're very excited to see what we can grow in this new situation. This is pickerel weed. Likes to grow in just a few inches of water and produces a very pleasant seed crop, apparently. I haven't had it yet, as is the case with a lot of these plants, but uh, it comes highly recommended and I'm excited to try it. We deliberately created the pond with a variety of different depths that give us a variety of different growing conditions to experiment with. It gets about four or five feet deep over here, which in theory can be more suitable for things like American lotus root, which is another uh, very nice crop, and also provide habitat for uh, you know, some of the frogs and crayfish that like to live here. Here's a little water swale that comes in. Um, it gets sort of boggier and boggier as it goes along from a little bit drier up there and then wetter and wetter and wetter until it gets into the water. We're very excited about these type of conditions, so let's say if we try to grow ostrich fern here for the fiddlehead shoots. By planting it all along this, this little drainage way, we can find out where its optimum growing zone is from a moisture point of view, and then based on that information, we can, we can do our next plantings. Here we have some kind of frog or toad eggs, um, which has been neat to see. Uh, we built this pond and then immediately it became full of uh, frog eggs and toad eggs which all hatched and, and you had uh, thousands of tadpoles. I, the water is a little murky at the moment from the recent rain, but I can see 
many tadpoles in here from where I am. Uh, they're kind of at the phase where they, they have their back legs and uh, still a, a tail and no front legs yet. So we're looking forward to planting a whole lot of wetland loving plants down in here, pawpaws, we've already got some of those started, um, aronia, swamp oaks of various kinds. Very excited to see what we can learn, uh, what we can grow uh, as we continue to develop this new section of the forest garden. One of the things I love in the forest garden is the community garden area. It wasn't something that I had planned on from the beginning, but some of my neighbors asked if they could do some veggie gardening in the forest garden, and it's been so great to have them here. I've learned a lot about veggie gardening from them, and they're out here bringing the place to life, producing uh, all kinds of great veggies. It's been, it's been a great partnership. Forest gardening is not going to feed the world tomorrow. That said, I am quite convinced that we need to move in the direction of forest gardening and other agroecology practices that will bring us toward a future where ecosystems are restored and people are actually eating better than we are currently. I'm grateful for the industrial ag system that provides us all this incredibly cheap food but it is displacing ecosystems at a global scale and we need to reintegrate with the ecosystems where we live. Small forest garden projects like this are not going to individually change the world, but I think every project does have a role to play in increasing our knowledge, increasing the conversation about how we can better work with and benefit from the ecosystems where we live. In this particular 10 acre spot in Bowie, Maryland, we have started to measure more systematically the yields that we are harvesting from this place so that we can learn how much food we're getting from this place and what works and what doesn't work so well. We do need to move toward systems that both supply the food and restore our ecosystems. We can't afford to continue indefinitely growing our food in ecologically dead zones. It's a lifetime of discovery and excitement to figure out the plants and then the culture around those plants that can take us to a future where hopefully our ecosystems are restored at the regional scale, wildlife habitat is improved, water quality is improved, and people are eating better so that they are more healthy and more integrated with their local ecosystem, the amazing forest of the eastern United States.